Mm, all right. What we've got here is one of the grabbiest hooks in the history of documentary cinema. Imagine one of the most famous women in the world has a stalker. Guy's been stalking her for years. So what does she do? She falls in love with him and they have a hot and heavy affair. And this guy, this stalker, is not what you're expecting. I mean, if we were doing a narrative drama, we would have to play a little loose with the casting. But this is reality. This is the guy. This is the guy that lived it. There's, not, there's nothing we could do about the way he looks, but uh, there's a few things he could do, but he's, he's not doing them. And then there's a big twist. So the hook with the stalker is just to get the butts in the seats. Then we pivot and we present this story as a romance. His story is one of romantic perseverance. It wasn't stalking. It was persistence. He fell in love with her when he was eight years old. And although he was discouraged and people were saying, hey, Gert, you're being weird. This obsession you have with her is not healthy. He didn't listen to those doubters. He didn't listen to those haters. He kept at it and was ultimately rewarded with a relationship with her. Of course, I think it's a good message. But did either of those two things happen? Either one of those scenarios? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not even close. Uh, we're going to have to take a lot of uh, poetic liberty. Let the phrase, one man's opinion, do a lot of work. Uh, no, the stalking victim slash female love partner will not be participating in this documentary, nor will anyone associate with her. However, you should hear who we do have lined up for this project. In addition to the stalker himself, we've got ABBA impersonators, is this a woman's jacket? The zipper is on the, this side. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so there's more than just ABBA impersonators in this film, but they do serve a very valuable function to say things the psychology experts and others are reticent to say, possibly because of their training in ethics. Well, I, I cannot even wrap my mind around it. It was the beautiful blonde who was attacked by the terrible, ugly man. Audience surrogates. Baby, my God. She could have every man she, she wanted. Uh, why him? What am I talking about and why are ABBA impersonators even part of the equation? Not that they shouldn't always be. I think abolitious should weigh in on all important policy decisions. But we are together today to discuss the 2023 Amazon Prime Nordic documentary, Take a Chance. Jag fastnade på Agnetas ögon. De var fina. Helt magiskt. Jag blev så kär i henne. Jag saknade henne enormt och det går nästan inte till enda dag så om jag inte tänker på henne. This documentary is packaged as a look into the very bizarre late 90s, early 2000s story where one of the singers of ABBA, Anietta Tharskug, one of the A's, the blonde one, she who sang Dancing Queen. Hello, I'm Agneta. I know it's very hard for you to pronounce, but you can say Anietta or you can say Anna. She was having trouble with a stalker. She ended up falling in love with and having a relationship with that stalker. And then the stalker, because he was a stalker, kept on doing stalker shit, so she had him arrested and deported out of Sweden. What makes this story even more interesting and bizarre is when you get to meet the stalker. And you will meet him if you watch this documentary. You're going to spend a lot of time with him. His name is Gert van de Graaff. At the time, he was a 36-year-old virgin forklift operator who had never been in a relationship, 
kind of socially awkward. Uh, at the time of this documentary, I think he's in his late 50s. It might strain your credibility that this is the person that was chosen by a woman of such prominence and affluence. But that's what makes it interesting. That's what makes the story irresistible is, is there more to the story? Does Anyeta have a very interesting inner life? Is there more to this guy that we're not seeing right away, but his charms will be revealed? Will our biases and assumptions be challenged? Hate to disappoint you, spoiler alert. No. And in fact, I don't believe that the story as presented happened. It's been said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. This documentary does not provide any proof, really. The documentary actually presents two possible scenarios. One is he was stalking her, she fell in love, kept stalking her, deported. The other one is that he was a victim of love. He fell in love with her from afar when he was young and through perseverance and force of will and a can-do attitude, somehow engineered himself a full-on romantic sexual relationship with the woman of his dreams. I do not believe either of those scenarios happened. I think this documentary is disingenuous and using nothing but the text that they present. Like, it's easy to say, well, I went and I looked at other sources and I, I did some research on my own. But just using what's available in this documentary, I came to a very different conclusion about what happened and what exactly the relationship between these two people is. I will bet that some of the people that they interviewed also came to that or a very similar conclusion, but it's not presented. It's just one or the other. All we absolutely know for certain is that at one point, she was frightened of him, had him arrested, and had him deported. On these shows, you always hear, I'm going to have you deported as like a threat or a punishment. Better watch out. I'm going to have you deported. I am going to guarantee I will get your ass deported. She actually did that. I mean, as unbelievable as all this sounds, ABBA as an institution is very strange. Things were different in the 70s. I know this took place in the 90s, but it's still 70s adjacent. You know, Fleetwood Mac rumors, that was a weird story too. So you never know. This documentary fails on a lot of levels. And it can be seen as a communication to weird dudes to go out and keep on stalking the women they're obsessed with because you never know. Even the title, Take a Chance. And I understand that this documentary could not have been called anything else, but still, it's still, take a chance. Maybe the 40th burnt doll you send her is going to be the one that unlocks her heart. I mean, look at Gert. He is gross in just about every way, but did he let that stop him? Did he let that slow him down? No. And through his own perseverance, he ended up having a brief relationship with Anyata from ABBA who eventually got rid of him in a very dramatic way. Now, what's dangerous about all of this is that I don't think a lot of people are going to see this documentary. I don't believe many people are going to seek out a Swedish and Dutch language documentary where the main star is someone that presents like Gert. Unless you have a vested interest, like you're a longtime ABBA fan, and longtime ABBA fans are going to react very negatively to this documentary. But a lot of people will hear about it. It will amplify this story, even if there's a big question mark at the end. Did Anyeta have this weird relationship? Isn't it so weird? And that's what's going to filter out into the ether. At the least, not cool. And at worst, it's harmful. And it's not fair. So let's take a look at what's presented in the documentary, and then I'll give you my opinion on what I think actually happened. Okay, so let's, uh, let's break this down. Let's take a look at Gert. So to hear Gert tell it, he was a lonely child, neglected, had no friends, miserable, sad, but one day his whole life changes when he sees ABBA 
perform Waterloo at the Eurovision Song Contest. After that, it's all Alba, all the time, falls completely in love with Anietta. However, to his dismay, he finds out that she's married to Bjorn, and this must be respected. So he waits until they are comfortably divorced in 1979 to begin his enterprise. And that consists of writing a lot of letters, like a lot of letters. As he gets older, this obsession only grows. When he reaches his 30s, he feels his biological clock ticking and needs to like step up his game. So he starts hunting Anjeta all over Sweden. Gert is what I guess you'd call a Swedophile. Oof. That doesn't sound great. In that he loves all things Sweden. Got a Volvo, likes some meatballs, whole thing. So he learns Swedish and he visits there a lot. He's a very analog stalker. He's been doing handwritten letters. And the main method of trying to find her has been going through the phone book. So he's out there. I don't know how common this name is, but apparently there's a lot of Anjeta Thalskogs in the Swedish phone books. So he's been going around like the Terminator looking for Sarah Connor, just bothering every Anjeta that he could find. Like, ah, you Anjeta Thalskog. Where is Anjeta Thalskog? It's over there, on the other side of the cold. It's just knocking on doors, bothering everybody. When I do not open this, so what a feel like that some stood there. On the other side of the So he meets a lot of people. Meets. He encounters a few people who are an on the other side of the cold, but not the, the genuine article. Now, there is a certain language of the cinema that we're all familiar with. Little shortcuts and cues to let us know how we should feel. And during this hunting on yet a part, there's this hopeful, jaunty music. Like, will he pull it off? Will he find her? You know, so you're there kind of rooting for him. Like, yeah, I hope you find her. I mean, dude, his luck finally changes when he tracks her to a, uh, a rural town, maybe a vacation town called Ekoro in Sweden. And a bartender just says, oh yeah, she lives over there and draws him a map. He keeps trying to run into her. Like he learns of her favorite sushi bar and I'm sort of charmed that the Dutch word for sushi bar is sushi bar. Sushi bar. I love loan words. So what happens next is truly astonishing. My California brain in 2023 cannot handle it. He was able to purchase a house near her. He became one of her neighbors. They gave a forklift driver warehouse worker a mortgage to purchase property in Sweden. That's what the 90s were like, I guess. I mean, they present it as like it's a dump, it's a shack, but it's still a house. A stone's throw from one of the most wealthy women in Europe. I'm sure Anietta is not living in some shitty place. I'm wondering if I could buy it now because they show it and it doesn't look like anyone's lived there since him. Maybe they dressed it or it's a different place, but I think it, it looks like it's the same place because it's got the same like polemic spear or whatever they call that. The same wallpaper, the wallpaper is important. I wonder how much he told the realtor. This is perfect. It's got a kitchen and a hookup for a dryer. And I'm, uh, I'm stalking the woman over there and uh, I will own her. I will own her. So let's put in a bid. Like, Jesus Christ. So that's sort of when his luck begins to change. And I think if he had left it at this particular point, this next part of the story already exceeds the wildest dreams of most fans. I know stalkers have a very different definition of success, but most fans, this would be dope. He moves in and because he's sort of in the neighborhood, he gets known. And he sees her just casually around, says happy birthday. So she's kind of getting familiar with him. Um, and 
if you didn't know the backstory, and Gert, bless his little Dutch heart, could present as maybe developmentally or cognitively disabled or delayed might not be seen as, you know, neurotypical. So it seems harmless, a new eccentric character in the neighborhood. Your guard might be down. You might think, you know, okay, there's this guy. He's maybe not all there, but seems nice enough, harmless. Remembered my birthday. Kind of gets acclimated to the idea of Gert around as many of us would i think i mean it was it was the 90s pre-internet it's kind of a more rural isolated part of sweden probably a different vibe you don't get so you know abba had been out of the spotlight for a long time almost 20 years at that point and yeah the abba renaissance of the 90s that kind of began around muriel's wedding had been kicking off and a lot of us ABBA fans were coming out of the closet, so to speak. So she was his name. He was her neighbor. Yeah, if you could just keep your shit together, Gert. Just enjoy what what's happening here. But of course not. So that's that's the situation where Gert and Anietta are. Anietta at this time in her life wasn't having the best time. Uh, she had some personal tragedies. Her parents died under upsetting circumstances. It's always upsetting, but just definitely upsetting circumstances. Uh, her second marriage after Bjorn had broken up. Gert's story at this point is a little unclear because I don't know where he was rushing to or what he was gonna do when he got there. But to hear him tell it, he had heard that Anietta was going through all these hardships. So he was rushing, driving his car very fast to go comfort her. I don't know, I was gonna pull up to her house. He got into a car wreck and totaled his car and got hurt. So he's at home convalescing and glory be who should appear at his doorstep with a pie and a friend and a friend, Agneta from ABBA, coming to check on her neighbor to, who she knew was a fan to try and cheer him up. And that part I believe is true because to hear Gert tell it after her little make-a-wish visit to a neighbor fan just to check in on him and try and cheer him up after a car accident. She was so enamored. She was so mesmerized by what she experienced in that shitty little cabin that she snuck back alone that night. And there began a steamy, passionate, sexual relationship that had to remain absolutely secret. And yet the sneaks back to his place and takes this 37 year old virgin and finally punches his V card. The reason that he is a 37 year old virgin, you remember, is that no other woman would do. So it's quite an accomplishment that he waited this long for this specific woman to come and do this specific thing. And she specifically came and did it. Despite how hot and heavy and true all of this was, couldn't tell soul. So let's take a look at uh, Anietta. Now of all the members of ABBA, it's pretty clear why he developed a parasocial relationship with Anietta specifically. Anietta, of course, or Anna, as her friends call her, is very beautiful, but also looks very uncomfortable. I tend to think of her as the human heart of ABBA. And I'll explain it this way. ABBA is a very controlled enterprise. The gentlemen, Bjorn and Benny, are just smile machines. They just smiling all the time. Don't really show emotion, except for blinding Swedish smiles and smiles and smiles. The other woman in ABBA, Anna Fried, who goes by Frida, is another story altogether. And as far as like a 35 year old, one of these 35 year old virgin type guys, 
Anna Fried is a little advanced. She looks like she knows what she's doing. She's self-possessed, confident, in your face. I mean, this is like, this is a woman. This is an experienced, mature woman. In fact, if you look her up now, and this is, this is true, her official title is Princess Annefried Roos. And she is the current Dowager Countess of Plauen. The Dowager Countess got it going on. Princess Annefried could be a bit intimidating. She's not even Swedish. As far as Frida goes, I'm not saying, oh, well, he picked the wrong member of ABBA to stalk, because I don't think he should be stalking any of them, but I am kind of saying that. It would be a different story altogether if he had fixated on Frida. Anietta, that's a whole other vibe. She does not seem confident. She does not seem to be enjoying herself. Most of her time with ABBA, she looks confused, uncomfortable, disoriented. I don't know what the hell's going on. Why has she got all this attention? What am I doing? You know, there are times where she seems to be enjoying herself, but if you watch her, most of the time, she looks like she wants to cry. I can see how that would be alluring to someone as inexperienced as Gert Van de Graaff. Here's someone that looks like she needs someone. ABBA songs in general seem to support that point of view. The main theme of ABBA songs are I want you and I wish you wanted me. We are broken up or in some way distant and I wish we weren't. We are officially broken up and I somehow need to come to terms with that, but it's difficult. And I made out with my teacher and fought in the Mexican-American War. And in the case of the visitors, I'm in outright emotional crisis. But what do I mean by she's the human core? Okay, that she's the, the human heart. What I think ABBA fans like about ABBA, I know I do, is that number one is the catchy nature of the songs and the way that the songs are constructed. I mean, ABBA has taught generations of songwriters how to do it. Even if they don't sound like ABBA, ultimately. I've always thought that, okay, the Beatles can inspire you to want to be a musician and write songs, but ABBA can like show you how to do it. In the post-ABBA world, many of the great songwriters are Swedish, so much that it's become sort of a cliche or, you know, with Green Day, with this like, okay, no Swedish songwriters. They're only the best in the world at it. No French chefs, no Italian food. But, you know, that kind of stems from, from ABBA. The second thing that I like about ABBA is that they're very technical. You don't hear about this a lot, but ABBA couldn't exist as it was without, like, technical advancements and studio tricks. There's a whole lot of, there's tons of overdubs and vocoders and just this relentless double female vocal right down the center, like zap, just coming out of a cannon at you. Except for a couple of awesome exceptions. That doesn't leave a lot of room for emotion, exactly. Emotion still comes across, but not like, you know, Mick Jagger singing Angie or whatever. You've got the guys smiling, and you've got Frida smoldering, and then you've got Anietta looking human, looking overwhelmed, looking in need of comfort, and singing about how I wish you loved me the way I love you. And that's sort of a recipe for, oh, I will treat her well, I will save her. She's not going to be threatening to me <laughs> like fucking Frida would be. I can protect her, I can comfort her. So I get it. I don't get it to the Gert extent. Now, Anietta after ABBA kind of dropped out of the spotlight. And in this particular period of her life, she was very reclusive. Swedish Greta Garbo just wants to be alone, as they say in the documentary. So those are our two main characters. And that's what they were doing up until the time that Gert says they got together. 
So let's explore their relationship. To recap, Gert moved out of his own country of the Netherlands, uh, moved over to Sweden, bought property near Anietta to be close to her, wrecked his car, and then while he was convalescing, she came over to say hello and to cheer him up because she knew he was a fan. According to him, later that night, she snuck back alone and thus began their torrid but secret affair. So let's talk about this idea that it's secret. Again, this is all according to Gert, because Anietta will not talk about any of this. It was definitely a physical, passionate love affair. But for whatever reason, no one could know about it. Although Anietta had property in, had a nice house down the street, and property and places to go in Stockholm. They would always have their assignations in Gert's shitty little rundown shack, because that's the way she wanted it. But, and this is where Gert's story starts to break down a little because it wasn't secret. Yes, he couldn't be introduced to her, her family, her kids. He needed to stay away. He was never invited to anything. He was, even though it was true love, he's not saying they were just fuck buddies because that would be crude. They were really like in love, but she had to pretend he didn't exist and would not acknowledge his presence. However, he says that they did go out in public. They went to her, they went to restaurants together. They went to movies together. Uh, I don't believe she was wearing a disguise. She might be recognized anywhere, but in Sweden, I mean, this is her hometown. She's pretty well known in Sweden. It's not like New Hampshire, Palo Alto, wherever, where she could probably blend in. Uh, people would notice her and notice that she was with some weird guy, like, but no one did. There's no, as far as I know, there's no restaurant owner, waitress, that said, oh yeah, I saw Anietta here and she was with some guy. Also, as far as keeping it a secret. All right, this should tell you a lot. Even though he's an obsessive collector who has major problems with boundaries, for whatever reason, he's saying that this boundary was uh, sacrosanct, never crossed it, except for the time I brought it up in a job interview. Gert skulle ju anställa som sin kund. Kunden och så säger han till mig så här att jag kan inte anställa er. Och då tänkte jag så här, det ljuger. Jag har sett henne tillsammans med Agneta Fältskog. <laughs> If he's bringing it up in a job interview, that's not keeping it secret. Yeah, he's like, yes, I know. I have much experience driving that forklift and I'm very familiar with this inventory system and also... I'm in a very passionate affair with Anjeta from ABBA. The blonde one. Like he brought, this is a job interview. And they called his like forklift agency and said, I can't, this is a fucking guy. So yeah, he wasn't keeping it a secret. He also told his ABBA pen pal friend who he completely skeeved out. Noe som ikke helt stemte. Jeg trodde at det var noe fantasi og han, som han involverte mig. So yeah, I ignored the brevet. I skrev it back. And she wasn't much of a pen pal friend after that. So there's two people in the documentary that he spilled the beans to, even though it's such a secret, such a secret. And also said they went out in public and there's no evidence of that. Even though he's such a pack rat and has all this ABBA shit everywhere, he didn't have a special napkin or... A, a love note that's expressively like, hi, I am Anietta, and in this note, I am going to make it clear that we are physical lovers. Nothing like that. No keepsake, no champagne cork. He, he says he didn't keep anything because he respected her too much. He respected being her shameful secret. The other thing is kind of weird. If I was dating someone, If I walked into her place and there were all these photographs of me from 25 to 30 years ago, I would be a little put off by that. Like, you know I've gotten older. 
a lot of stuff has happened in the past three decades. So if this is like the frozen, idealized version of of me that you like, actually, I don't know. Depending on where I was in my life, I might lean into it. <laughs> <laughs> but Anyata doesn't seem like the person that would be overly impressed with that or might be willing to put on her little outfit from the uh... on one hand he's so careful about keeping her secret and on the other hand he doesn't give a fuck about keeping her secret how does this love affair end according to Gary Anyata was a little too jealous he says they went to see a film and Apparently, he liked the actress a little too much. Pretty young thing by the name of Helena Bergstrom. Agneta was saying, you were looking at her. I saw you sat in that theater for two hours looking at her. Um, so they got into a big fight and they broke up. However, don't worry. Don't worry. They got back together. Because she could not stay away from that sweet, sweet girt. She was hurting for a girton. God. So, yeah, they meet up again, they get back together, they start going at it, and then the real end, there is no reason. One day, she just broke up with him and said, I'm never going to talk to you again, because she's a meanie. She's a big old blonde meanie. No reason, just see you later. Stay out of my life. I mean, he was, he was never going to let that be the end of it. So that's when he picked up his letter writing campaign again, because it had been so effective in the past. He just starts writing her hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of letters. I want you back. I love you. Blah, 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 blah. Does not work. Here's where the fun turns ugly. She's not responding to him. She's made it clear that even if they did have a relationship, she's not into it anymore. It's time to move on. See if Kylie Minogue is available. But he wasn't going to have that. So on Christmas, he just goes to her house and starts like looking in her windows. She calls the cops and they take him away and says, this guy has been stalking me. And of course it goes to court because as I've said many times, deported. So here's where I had some pretty high hopes for this documentary. Because I'm like, okay, we got court, we got documents, we got testimony, we got all kinds of shit. I'm going to see if this is real. Because I keep being told that Anyeta admits to the affair. I don't really, I don't really see that happen. And when we're talking about evidence, this is where the documentary gets really shady because... Let's talk about the photograph. Everybody has seen this photograph. Everybody involved with this documentary has seen that photograph. You cannot convince me otherwise. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been invited to participate. Maybe they asked them to reenact how they responded when they first saw it. Because everyone's like, oh, wow. 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 And it's just like, come on. You've seen, it's been on the cover of the Daily Mail like a hundred times at this point. And it doesn't prove fucking anything. I believe it to be a real photograph. I do not believe it proves what Gert would have us think it proves. Shit, I have our hand to hand to a shot. They can see it. They are not hand in hand on that couch. Anyeta has her own hands entwined with one another. He says it was taken by his mother, who does not participate in the documentary. I think it was taken by the friend that came with Anyeta. So that the guy wouldn't get too weird if it got weird. She'd at least have a friend with her. I mean, that's the, the, that's the biggest smoking gun that proves they knew each other. Like, yeah, they knew each other. They were neighbors. And what are some of the other pieces of evidence that are uh, compelling to me. We don't hear Agneta testify really, even in Swedish or even read a transcript. The most compelling piece of evidence is in the police report. She says something like, he never hit me, but it will, it seemed to be heading that way. Now that he never hit me or he never got violent, 
could be interpreted as when we were together in our intimate partnership, he never physically abused me. And that's what Gert and the filmmakers would like you to take away from that. It also could mean when I went over, when I saw him around town, because he was a fixture in this small town, he never physically menaced me until the night that he physically menaced me and he got arrested. So there's not, there's still not there that much there. They're not enough, man. Not the extraordinary proof of the extraordinary claim. When the documentary goes, all oh, good, oh my God, she totally admitted it. They don't really back that up. They show a lot of headlines that are in Swedish. And it's still not entirely clear to me under what circumstance Anjeta said the famous quote of, he wore me down and I wanted to get to know him because he wore me down. Even then, she never says anything like, and we were lovers and I was attracted to his smile and he was so funny. So that's why we became physical lovers and had a romance. She never says anything like that. Maybe she does, but I think if she had, that it would be front and center. But we don't see or hear anything like that. The bottom line, I'm going to tell you what I think happened. I think from Anietta's point of view, she's a very nice person. She has a, a sweet demeanor and cares about her fans and cares about people. And she heard that the weird guy that's hanging around that wished her happy birthday was in a car wreck and was a big ABBA fan. So she would walk next door and say hello, take a few pictures, cheer him up, you know, just be a good neighbor and a good person and a good celebrity. And he took that and turned it into all this bullshit in his brain. His mushy, mushy brain. That really is a big bummer because it just teaches people and it teaches celebrities, no, don't engage, don't be nice, don't reach out to your neighbors. You know, you got to keep distance and not get involved and not do nice things because people are going to get weird and they're going to start looking in your windows at Christmas and going, and the other, our big love affair that we had and being in documentaries and broadcasting to the whole world about how we were fucking every night. And it was so great until you couldn't handle some actress because you were that petty. Apparently there's this epidemic of loneliness and everyone is having trouble with social connections and we're not friendly to each other and we don't support each other. And then someone does and this happens. It's a big pain in the ass that's going on 23 years later on Amazon Prime Nordic. Gert, for his part, has no idea that he's done anything, anything wrong, that this is weird. He's mostly upset that people don't believe this happened because it probably did not. I mean, ultimately, despite how weird and lonely he sounds, stalking Anjeta has been a net positive for Gert. He's got all this attention. He's semi-famous. I mean, prior to this, there was a book written about him in a play based on that book uh, called Fans. They interviewed that author in this documentary. So all of this is just amplifying this myth, this urban legend that this thing happened where a stalker through persistence was able to gain the affection of his stalkee, even for a time, is, uh, is quite compelling and dangerous. Because yeah, Gert has no idea. He believes himself to be a jilted lover. Stalkers never see the truth of the situation. But I mean, ABBA has brought so much happiness into the world. And this world needs happiness. To see any one of them punished for kindness is very unfortunate. Interfacing with ABBA in any way is just a shortcut to a shot of happiness. It really is. I mean, no matter, no matter how many times you've heard the songs or seen any of those old videos, anytime you strap on the headphones and like look at ABBA on Top of the Pops or some Danish show from 1976, it's just like happiness. It really, it lightens your mood and it just makes you feel better. 
They've been making people feel better for 50 years. All right, can we talk about something a bit more cheerful? Anything you like. Do you like ABBA? I love ABBA. Yeah. 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 In fact, ABBA received the best YouTube comment of all time, one of my favorites, and it's on the Chikatita video. And it says, Dear parents, just because your child is smiling at their phone doesn't mean they have a boyfriend or girlfriend. They're just watching this masterpiece. <laughs> love that. I don't know. So uh, hopefully I've made my case. And I've convinced you, you don't really need to watch this documentary. It's not that great. Uh, you don't really need to spend an hour listening to Gert. And it doesn't really prove anything. And who knows? Maybe they did. I don't know. I just, I would have liked to see more something. More proof. I mean, I'm glad that Sweden was responsive to Anietta and took it seriously. I don't know if that would have happened if she was just a regular person. There's plenty of victims of stalking where the police don't take it seriously or the courts don't take it seriously. So I'm glad that in this case, because of her prominence, that this was taken care of. But remember that there's a lot of people out there that are dealing with this and don't have her resources. Shit like this film doesn't help. Even if it doesn't make it worse, it does not help. No one thinks they're a Gert. But there's a lot of Gerts. Don't be a Gert. Don't be a Gert. Uh, thank you. My name's David. I will talk to you soon.